Pastor Joe here. We're going to jump in to the book of Jonah. You know, this is a book, the more I've looked at it as we prepared for this list study, uh, the more excited about it I've become. I did a four-part series on this, I guess maybe over a decade ago, just on Wednesday night study. The more I look at it now and, and, and the notes I prepared then, plus my research now, that's more I wished I had uh, preached it as a series here more recently. It certainly dovetails our study with Elijah that we've recently finished. So, uh, as we start here in our September lift groups, taking this through October 1st, about four parts, there's certainly a lot more than we could cover in, in just four weeks. But I encourage you, approach this uh, this particular book of Jonah as a student of God's Word. Approach it with a hunger. I, think, I mean, it's only 48 verses for long, I believe, totally. So it's a very short book, uh, four chapters, and we're going to outline some of it for you. And then our lift leader is going to take some instruction. I'm just not going to give a whole lot of instruction. I'm going to give some illustrations and some basic outline ideas each week to our leaders. But a lot of this will be relying upon each and every one of you to take the time to read the book. Uh, I would say you have four studies here. I would take chapter one and spend all week reading it. I'd, I'd read it three or four times. I'd, I'd listen to it. If you have one of those Bible applications on your phone or whatever, when you're driving to work, just put it on and have it read it to you. Uh, I'd take time before you go to bed at night maybe to read that chapter again. But read this thing three or four times. Take some notes along the side in your, in your, in your notebook or on the side of your margin of your Bible. But there's going to be a lot that God's going to show you from this particular study. Uh, I, I just I just wrote down and for something that uh, J. Vernon McGee, great uh, Dr. McGee, wrote these things. He said the six facts that you, you, you could pick up from here. One is that uh, th this sets forth the book of Jonah, probably as no other book, and it's even referred to in this way in the New Testament, as the book of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Three days in the belly of the well, three days in the belly of the earth. Uh, where Exodus sets forth the story of redemption and uh, Talks about deliverance from sin but through the through the, the pictures we see of in Egypt and deliverance from there, uh, where Ruth is kind of the romance of redemption. Esther deals with the the the, the romance of redemption and the providence uh, of God's grace in our redemption. Job uh, deals with repentance and redemption. Jonah deals with resurrection and redemption. But yet, there's still so much application. You could you could even title this 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 book like something like. Uh, uh, don't miss the blessings of God. And Jonah keeps running from these blessings of God. You, you go through this, but first of all, it is a, it sets forth the, the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Two, I think a truth that comes out of this is salvation is by grace and grace alone. Three, what we learn from this is that God's grace cannot be frustrated. He's, he's going to get Jonah to Nineveh. No one He's going to do his will there. Uh, four is that God doesn't cast us off when we've been unfaithful. Praise God we see that in Jonah's life. Five, God is good, and God is gracious. Six would be this. God is just as much God over the Gentile worlds as he is the, the nation of Israel. That God is the God of all creation, God of all worlds. If we look back to our st study of Elijah, we, we saw that Elijah had to learn that lesson as well. So we're going to see in, the, in, in all of this, if we, as we study the Word of God together, just how God moves so sovereignly and supernaturally in our lives when we let him. This has been approached by a lot of different theologians over the years. Some approach it like it's an allegory. And they very clearly say this is allegorical. Uh, and there's just lessons learned. This is a it's a great fairy tale, so to say, you know, about this guy being swallowed up. And then Jonah was a fictitious person. Some approach it as though Mother Jonah may be real, but this is more of a parable, you know, the parable story about where, uh, like Lazarus, you know, or, or some of the other stories that people like to put in that category. Uh, this is not parabolic, nor is it uh, allegorical. Uh, Jesus makes reference to the book of Jonah, and he doesn't reference it as parables or allegory. He references it as fact, and we'll see that in our study, even in this first study tonight. But as you go through it, I, I think you could break this down into these these four chapters could be outlined like this. I put number one, Jonah and the storm, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. Two, Jonah and the fish. That'll be our second study. The third is Jonah and the city. The third, the fourth, Jonah and and the Lord. So this is the way it kind of breaks down simply if you want to just look at it. And atheists, yes, atheists love to question this book and mock this book. Uh, but to, to do so, to mock the book of Jonah and say it's not real, well then just pretty much the whole word of God becomes target at that point. What is real in the word of God? I'm of the camp, and I know you are, that we believe the Bible is the, is, has, is, is the entire word of God and that it is penned by God and by the Holy Spirit. And if this were a parable, then it would be introduced as a parable. 
parable, but it's not. It's introduced way many other books. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. You know, the word of the Lord here. So we're, we don't look at it in, in that regard. But Jonah is even referred to in other places in Scripture as a prophet. In Second Kings chapter 13, he's referred to as a prophet of God. So I believe the story is real, and I think anything to suggest otherwise would just be foolishness, even though the liberals and the atheists will mark it down that way. Uh, and secondarily, I think it's real because tradition strongly attests to the historicity of it. Uh, again, with Jesus and, and what he says. People say, well, what about the well? Well, the well's not really a good translation. In fact, we make a big deal about the well, but I think there's only like three verses that, that actually deal with the well. When we look at that next week, we call it Jonah and the fish or Jonah and the well. But uh, yeah, I believe that God is the God of creation and he can make anything and everything. The Bible says that God prepared a fish, so we'll deal with that, what that literally means when we do our study in that chapter. But so I believe that God prepared this great fish. Uh, the Greek translates it as well in the New Testament. It, I think a more proper translation would be a monster of the sea, this large fish. But uh, the, the modern critics would say, well, it's just not possible for a person uh, to be swallowed by a well and survive three days. I'm giving to your leader a couple things he'll read to you in a moment about uh, that, that relate to that. Stories of history and scientifically proven stories that are out there. I'll just give you this one. I'm going to read it to you. It's, uh, it's a story that was related by Sir Francis Fox, but it's, it was carefully investigated. This story was by two different scientists, and it comes out of uh, uh, the, the writings of uh, uh, a journal of debates of Paris, uh, well known as, as a man of sound judgment and careful writer. He relates the incident this particular way, all right? And uh, he says, in February 1891, the whale ship Star of the East was in the vicinity of the Falkland Islands, and the lookout sighted a large sperm whale just three... Uh, miles away. Two boats were assigned and lowered in a short time while the harpooners was enabled to spear the fish and the second boat attached to the well. But that boat was upset by a lash of the tail of the fish and the men throw, were thrown in the sea. One was drowned and another, James Bartley, just disappeared into the sea. He could not be found, supposing he had drowned. The well was killed and in a few hours the great body was lying by the ship's side and the crew busy with axes and spades, removing the blubber. Gets this. They worked all day, part of the night. Next day, they attached some tackle to the stomach, which was pulled out and hoisted on the deck. The sailors were startled by spasmodic signs of life. Inside was found the missing sailor, doubled up, unconscious. He was laid on the deck and treated to a bath of seawater, which soon revived him. It's amazing to me, but his mind was not clear, and my mind wouldn't be either. And he, he was placed in the captain's quarters where he remained two weeks a raving lunatic. He was kindly and carefully treated by the captain and the officers of the ship and gradually gained possession of his senses. At the end of the third week, he had entirely recovered from the shock and resumed his duties. During the sojourn in the well's stomach, Bartley's skin were exposed to the action of gastric juice, underwent a striking change. His face, his neck, his hands were bleached to a deadly whiteness and took on the appearance of parchment. Bartley affirms that he would have lived inside this house of flesh until he starved, for he lost, uh, he lost his senses through fright and not from lack of air. Bartley is also said to explain that after being hurled into the sea, he said the waters foamed about him, evidently from the lashing of the whale's tail, and he was drawn along into darkness and found himself in a great place where the heat was intense. In the dark, he felt around for an exit and found only a slimy, slimy walls around him. Then the awful truth rushed into his mind and he became unconscious till the seawater bathed, revived him on the ship's deck. Now again, this story was, was investigated by two different scientists and proven to be a real truth and a story. There are a couple of things I have the lift leaders to have, have shared with you. But the, the, the chapter one basically starts out with Jonah in the storm. You might even say you can run, but you can't hide. It says the word of the Lord came to Jonah and he took off. It's not like Elijah when it says the word of the Lord came to, jo to, to Elijah, or when Elijah says, I stood before the Lord, and he delivers the message that God's given it, gets given him. This is a picture of a man running from that call, running from that, from that, that ministry that God had given him to go preach to the Ninevites, all right? Uh, he didn't want to preach to the Ninevites, obviously, before he took off. And I know there's a lot of 
uh, I don't know how to say this and not offend too many people, social justice warriors who will take this story and say, this is a story of a man who was a bigot. He's a racist. He didn't want to deliver this message of grace to the Syrians. But I don't believe that Jonah was a, a racist or a bigot. I believe he was a prophet of God. I believe he was a man of God. But I believe this is not a story of uh, petty, spirited bigotry, but I believe it's a story of heroic patriotism. He loved God's people. The Assyrians were a weak nation at this particular point, but they had been a nation of great power. Uh, they were brutal at one time when they attacked Israel. Uh, if you want to kind of characterize them to a, a culture or context, you might say the Assyrians were the Nazis of the day. The worst they could imagine to do to people, they actually did. They were, they were horrendous. Nahum writes this about them. Woe to the bloody city, all full of lies and plunder. No end to the prey, the crack of the whip, the rumble of the wheel, galloping horses and bounding chariot, horsemen charging, flashing sword and glittering spear, Hosts of slain, heaps of corpses, dead bodies without end. They stumble over the bodies, and all for the countless whorings of the prostitute, graceful and of deadly charms, who betrays nations with their whorings and peoples with their charms. He's describing the Assyrians and just how brutal and how wicked these particular people were. And when you start looking at history, and you can be sure that, uh, that Jonah knew the history of these people, and, and how wicked they were. You see, you see just how ungodly, and uh, they were in re regards to, you know, the the, the people of Israel. Uh, Jonah had a pretty good reason. He lived in a place where it was kind of on the edge of the frontier between Israel and, and the Syrians, and he he was familiar with all the ungodly, horrible atrocities that they did. Let me read something for you. Let me interrupt right here. Uh, we seem to have a problem with the videos when we got it back to our lift leaders the first time and, and they shared, hey, the video just cuts off for some reason. I'm left there staring at the screen as you just saw. But let me just pick it up from there, where are we going? Because what we've said, I, I don't want to redo that. It's, it's right where it needs to be and on target with what the study is talking about. But I do want to talk a little bit more about the, the Assyrians and the wicked uh, ravaging tri uh, battles that they fought and the wrath and the wickedness and the and the just the, what they left behind in the trail and, and when they went into these slaughterous battles that they fought. They, they were a cruel people. I said, I was going to read you something. Here's what I'd like to read you. It's from Professor John Urquhart. And he's talking about just how wicked the Assyrians were. It says, No consideration of pity was ever made or permitted to stand in the way of Assyrian policy. It couldn't afford the garrisons to its conquest. So it practiced a plan which largely dispensed with the necessity for leaving garrisons behind the Assyrian armies. In other words, once they conquered, they just destroyed. They didn't try to leave a supporting staff behind. There was unsparing slaughter to begin with. The king seemed to gloat in their inscriptions over the spectacles presented by the field of battle. The, they describe how it was covered with the corpse of the vanquished. The carnage would be followed up by fiendish inflictions upon the individual cities. The leading men at Lachish, when Sennacherib had conquered the city, those men were led forth seized by their executioners and subjected to various punishments, all of those punishments filled to the brim with horror. Some of the victims would be held down while another band of torturers who were portrayed in the monuments, they gloat fiendishly over their feel for works, insert their hands into the hands into the mouths of the victims, grip their tongues, wrench it out by the roots. And others they would, be, they would be spot pegs driven into the ground to which the victim's wrists are fixed with cords and his ankles similarly made fast. And the man is stretched out, unable to move a muscle. Then the executioner would apply himself to his task. What was that task? Urquhart went on to say, they would take a sharp knife, make an incision, and the skin would be raised inch by inch until the whole flesh of the man was flayed off him while he was living. Those skins would be stretched out upon the city walls are disposed of so as to terrify the people and leave behind the long enduring impression, impression of Assyrian vengeance. For others, long sharp poles are prepared. The sufferers taken all the rest from the leading them in the city are laid on the ground. The sharp end of the pole is driven through the lower part of their chest, all right, coming up this way. And then those poles are raised, bearing the writhing victim alive, just planted in a hole dug for it, and the man is left to die. And there are other atrocities. You just read some of the histories. as a professor says who talks about these atrocities and the different kings and how they gloated in it. But every man in Israel knew these things about the Assyrians. 
They also knew that there were prophecies saying that one day the Syrians would come and bring judgment, uh, that God would allow them to conquer Israel. Uh, when it talks about Jonah here, uh, I think he was aware of these prophecies of Isaiah. He's aware of the prophecies of Hosea. He's coming in on the, the heels of Hosea with his ministry. Uh, and Hosea talks about this in chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 11. Amos talks about the Assyrian uh, judgment. His ministry possibly overlapped a bit of Jonah's. He tells of God's judgment that uh, would that would be upon Israel. He wrote it this way, The Lord God will do nothing, but he reveals his secret unto his servants, the prophets, which means that these prophets were telling the people what was to come. And so it says that Jonah, upon hearing this, about this, that the Syrians could possibly repent and be restored, be healed, not be judged as God was going to do. What if they repented? Then they would probably come against the nation of Israel. So when it says that Jonah fled from the presence of the Lord, this has to do not so much with the, uh, him trying to run from God, outrun God. It has to do with him as, a, as a leaving the ministry, pretty much. Uh, just quitting, I'm done. I think we saw that in Elijah with our series there, that he just the idea is that, that I'm done. I think he's saying, I would rather be cursed by God, you know, uh, than to see the Assyrians survive and destroy my family, my home, and my nation. Paul said something similar in Romans chapter 9. Oh, that I were cursed. I would, I'd be willing to be judged myself that my people, my, my brothers would be, be saved. So when you look at, at Jonah, and as we study Jonah, I think we see in Jonah a heart for the nation of Israel. And he's trying not to run from God's presence. He knows God's omniscient. He's a prophet of God. He's just saying, I'm done. And uh, he's there. He's in the boat. He knows, first of all, the storm has come because of him. He tells the sailors, this is all happening because of me. He knows he's running from the Lord. He knows that, that God's dealing with him. And again, why is he running? Because I think it was a heart of more of a patriotism than it was a bigotry or anything like that. Hey, this is a great, great study. Uh, again, I encourage you to read these chapters uh, each week pr prior to your studies together and uh, spend some time with God. Make some notes yourself as your leader gets into this. Have some discussion time, but be prepared. Don't just kind of come not read the, the study of the scripture each week. Come knowing what the Bible has to say. Looking forward to hearing some great reports from you lift leaders. God bless you.